everybody. How's it going? Welcome to the Matt and Mark About Music Podcast. Man, what you been up to? What's going on, Mr. Earth Not Rocker? Mr. Earth Rocker. You're the Earth Rocker, aren't you? I've been rocking the earth. That's yes, all your I peeps, have. right? <laughs> your posse is called the Earth Rockers. Well, I'm your uh, co-host, Mark Allen V, and you are? Matt Mason. Matt Mason. Hey, it's great to see you guys again. Sorry we've had a little hiatus. You know, sometimes life gets in the way, and uh, hope everybody enjoys our new backdrop. It kind of looks like an ultrasound, I just realized. But, hey, whatever, you know. <laughs> we're birthing some new stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, well, man, we're working hard. <laughs> we are working hard. So, man, quick recap. What have you been up to? I know that you've got uh, some exciting stuff you've done the last couple of months. Man, huh? I've, been, I've been going full, full force at it, you know. Awesome. It's like this year has been kind of all about rolling out content. Yes, yes, content's important, you isn't know, it? I had those I had those three months or four months, you know, early at the beginning of or the end of last year and the beginning of this year where I couldn't play when I broke mm-hmm. my finger. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, I got to do something different this year. So rather than kill myself playing, you know, I think in the last fifteen years I've played between seventy five and one hundred and seventy five shows a year. Okay, you're just bragging now, but no, no that's I, impressive. It's seriously no. Impressive. I mean, it's just like you know, you, you're you're just going at it, and you're learning. A, yeah, you're learning a craft every Absolutely. time I go out there. I'm learning something. So, you know, I've I've just been going at it so so crazy the last however many years. You know, I was like, hey, you need to get some of this stuff out there that's mm-hmm. been on. Get it off your chest, you yeah, know? Yeah, absolutely. Man. You know, so I, I I've put out that uh, "Be the Wolf" and "Live at Kane's Ballroom" record, and I did a bunch of videos we've done how many episodes of this podcast 17 or 18 so far and yeah man so it's just been like the year of realizing that creating content and getting it out there is the name of the game well, absolutely and you've been doing a lot of that stuff i see things on instagram see things on facebook you got your little ditties here and there and uh it's just it's definitely entertaining and i guess you know it's you got to hit it from all angles. You really do. Well, right. It's just not enough to go, hey, I'm great. Buy my music. Right, right. I mean, well, every, so, there's so many people in any genre of music online that are great. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so you got to get them into the story. You got to let them into, you know, what your life is. What, mm-hmm. are you, what are you doing, you know? And I've done some of those Facebook Live videos to try to, like, show people. I'm mm-hmm. just a normal guy that, you know, is not famous, but... I'm out there making music and having a good time doing right. it, you know? And, you know, it's really nothing new. If you look back at the old days, our old days, you know, Hit Parader magazine and, and <laughs> you know, Guitar for Practicing Musician, it's like we read all that content. It's just, it gives you that insight. The thing is, nowadays, it's like 24-7, in your face, <laughs> Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all that. Yeah, it's Musically, like... <clears throat> I guess it's TikTok now. Would you like uh, a drink out of a fire hose? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, well, that's, big, that's turned us into definitely uh, content junkies, so that's for sure. Definitely. It's, there's something about it, and I know psychologists have talked about it, and, you know, I've mentioned it as well, too. It's like, it, it just does something with the neurons in your brain. It's just hitting you, and, and people become addicted to that. They mm-hmm. really do. Yeah. So that's really how you got to kind of play the game. Mm-hmm. So a couple of weeks ago, I guess a couple months ago, a friend of ours, Bob Laughlin, Blazing Bob. Yeah. Shout out, bro. Right on, dude. Uh, he's, he's getting back into it. He's had a little hiatus, and he's, he's getting back into it. And this guy, he goes way back into the 80s. I mean, he was he's playing on the Sunset Strip back in the 80s and things like that. So he's had a lot of how different. How tall was his hair, dude? Oh, uh, uh, there's some photos that have surfaced recently. We'll have to pull those up and link to them. It's, it's pretty cool <laughs> now we always called him gene simmons because he definitely looked like gene simmons well actually it looks better than gene simmons but you know that's for the ladies to decide not me <laughs> but so yeah he, and he loves kiss so it always worked out that way but he's he well anyway the, what i was saying is that he's he's getting back into the music and he posted something on, on facebook a couple months ago saying hey you know for all you folks that have been following my career all these years and stuff i got all this this things from years and years ago would you guys be interested in if i released it my answer to that, Bob, is absolutely release it. Absolutely, dude. But here's the caveat. Don't press a CD. Don't try to release it as an album. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with you, man, because here's the thing. It's hard, to, it's hard to gauge, though, because what I've kind of understood is like, okay, people in a certain age group, they do certain things. Like the people, say, under, under 40 – I'd say 75% of those people probably don't really buy music anymore. They download it or they listen to it online. Um, The people that are 40 and over, they spend such a small Mm -hmm. amount of money on music because they're still, you know, putting kids through college, whatever their case (laughs) is. You know, they don't have a lot of disposable income to spend money on CDs. And so it's like you got to figure out who your audience is, who your market is, Mm -hmm. but, you know, you got to stick your toe in the water somehow and getting it out there. And it's just never been easier to get it out there in the, 
in the stream of things. Whatever stream yeah. you want to get it in, you can get it in there. It was kind of funny. You talk about CDs. Last night I went to a concert. It was uh, Mercy Me and David Crowder. And I think it was Crowder. It says, yeah, we got this thing. If you want to come on out and we'll sign it, it's called a CD. It's it's like yeah. it's like Spotify to go. Right. <laughs> it's like a hard copy of Spotify that I can sign for you. <laughs> so that's that's kind of funny. But you know, it's it's a good point. So the CD is not the not the way to go. Now, do you just put it all out there to stream it all right away, or do you just kind of trickle it out there? I'm kind of of the opinion you kind of trickle it out there. Mm-hmm. You know, just little teaser. You, this day and age, especially if if you're doing the you're focusing on the internet this day and age of where you have to release an entire album, unless it's a concept album, which yes, yeah, absolutely cool, but you don't have, you can just do single by single yeah. really. And you know, you can go, you can go on uh, CD baby or something like that. And you can, you know, buy blocks of this stuff. So you get it down a couple of bucks per single yeah. and, and just constantly think. So this got me thinking, and that's always a dangerous thing. It is <laughs> dangerous. It's got me thinking though. It's like, Let's kind of look at the way life was versus the way life is when it comes to being a musician. So, you know, back in the day, like you and I would collaborate, we'd kind of write some songs. So we're considered songwriters. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go into the studio, you are now considered a recording artist. Mm-hmm. You go and do your live gigs, you're now a performer. You know, a live, a live showman or show lady, you know, don't want to gender. Show person. Show person, thank you. Yeah. Because you say showgirls, that's an entirely different thing. <laughs> anyway. I like showgirls, though. <laughs> <laughs> Radio edit. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, but now, most DIY musicians, come on, let's face it. Your your platform is the internet. Mm-hmm. Whatever 100 million different apps that are out there this week, your platform's the internet. Mm-hmm. So you are no longer just a songwriter or just a studio musician or just a recording artist or, or performer. You are a content creator. Yeah. And that's an entirely different game. Absolutely. You have to be an entrepreneur. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. I, and I've, I felt like this year has helped me clarify that very mm-hmm. thing. It's like, okay, I try to be as creative in your in your marketing and your business as you are in your music. Absolutely. You know, it's like, I've, I, and it's just hard to flex that muscle sometimes because they both kind of go against each other. Mm-hmm. And you're like, man, I spent all this time and all this effort and all this Money I didn't have on these recordings. I, I I need to recoup some money. Don't forget about it. Forget that. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the famous guys are having way less money coming in from album sales. Oh right, and stuff. right. And that's that's why they're doing the the promos. I even saw you know Adam ruins everything. Have you ever seen that show? It's on Learning or True TV. It's called Adam ruins everything. He basically takes these things we thought we knew about and he goes in and starts uh, picking them apart. And he's talking about the record industry and how. Uh, you know, a lot of these these hip hop artists and stuff are out there, and they're they're promoing this, and they're they're selling this, and they've got their name on that, and they're like, "You're such a sellout," and he's like, "You have to." Yeah. Nobody's making money on selling music anymore. It's like going back to to the '30s and '40s, where you know, before phono records were even a thing, mm-hmm. before you're making any money off it. It's it's you know, if you're the songwriter, you're getting your royalties off that, but you're out there hitting the pavement. You're you're playing the the shows and. On a tour bus, two hundred nights a, a year. So. If you're lucky, right, right, and you're probably going the whole doing that, right. So, but that's kind of where we are now. But with the internet, you got so many different options, and you really have to hit them all. I mean, I, Nuno Betancourt, you know, I'm 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 watching him on Instagram, and every night he's got something going on. Yeah. It's he's taking pictures. You know, Steve Vai, same thing. It's like, you, it's it's about engaging your audience because really, what is the ultimate goal? What do we try to build? The super, the, fan. the super fan, the list of the super fans. That's something that we learned at the conference. It's mm-hmm. like, you're not going to be able to sell a million records. Sorry guys, not happening anymore. So the thing about selling a million records is that the record companies would push it down your throat with the, with the MTV and, and your trust rail radio and stuff like that. And it'd be the hip thing. And everybody run out. I got to get this record. They may not even care about your band. They just love that one song. And because that's the only way to get it is to buy a, an album with, with nine other songs that were not all that great. That's not going to happen anymore. So what you really want is to get yourself a, a, a good, solid list, a couple thousand, 10,000 super fans. And these are the ones that are going to follow you on Instagram. They're going to, they're going to follow you on Twitter. They're going to retweet. They're going to like every video and stuff like that. And, and then you, you pick at every one of these little things to try to monetize it. I mean, gosh, how many... Every day there's, there's some new hot shot, going to be a millionaire off of Instagram... And, and you know, and then you become influencers and all this stuff. It's like, so you really are, you're building your, a brand. It's not necessarily about just the music. It's about the brand, about who you are. And you can be true to your music. 
I, I really believe you can be true to your music. There's never a better time to be an indie artist right. than right now. Exactly. So and be, there's never been a worse time to be an indie no, that's artist true. than right now. I think it's the worst time to be any sort of artist because, you know, if you want to play the record label game... Uh, Man, there ain't you, much game left to play. Really. Right. It will Especially certainly for people who aren't really writing, like, what's considered to be mainstream mm -hmm. music. Whatever that is, I don't know. I, I just sort of... Yeah. figure out what I like and what I do and just kind of like exist in that world, you know? And it's not even about writing anymore because remember that first session that we went to at, at the DIY conference? It was those people from, uh, what, GIT, MI, mm -hmm. Music in Institute, Musicians mm -hmm. Institute. And first, one of the first questions they said, oh, who, who's singer-songwriters? A couple of people raised their hands. Who's just, uh, you know, bar gigs? A couple of people raised their hands. Who are producers? And all these hands go up. Now, do you and I, a producer is... You know, that's that's the guy that's that's your mutt lang and that's guy that really crafts stuff. No, today the word producer, you know, that that's your your hip hop guys. It's it's your chain smokers and those those guys that are <laughs> they're out there and they're, they're spending all night sampling this and sampling that and they're putting together all these things and you know, dead mouse and all. They're they're, they're considered producers and you got this room full of people that are doing it. Why? Because it's easy. Because you can take your MacBook mm. and you can take your Garage Band and you can start kicking out stuff really easily yeah and then it's just a matter of you know what's what's the next level you're gonna take it mm -hmm. so yeah and that's that's what selling the records these days you know you know uh, well there's just so many outlets the yeah. thing is you know it used to be like hey if you heard that new band on such and such radio station mm -hmm. then you know it was like clockwork you know uh three or four or five days later they'd announce hey they're coming to kane's ballroom you know tickets mm -hmm. or however much and, you know in a month they'd play their first single and maybe a couple of other cuts, you know, and then the show would come around and they'd built up more momentum and more momentum. And mm -hmm. it was just like, it's a totally different world now, dude. Totally sure different. Is. Sure is. So that's why you got to change the game. Yeah. And that's why we're talking about doing the internet stuff. And, uh, so my, my stance, what I'm going to start doing is I'm just going to release a song every periodically, every periodically. <laughs> First thing, I got to find a little time to record it. So I'm taking a whole block of time off at, at Thanksgiving. I'm going to actually go in and just do acoustic versions, a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to release that. And that's okay because, you know, before it's always like, oh, I got to, I'm going to spend all this time, all this money making this, this CD project. I want to be the top notch. I wanted to have all this production behind it and stuff like that. Great. But you can also go ahead and just release acoustic versions now yeah. and find out which ones are catching some traction. It says, okay, this is cool. Now I want to take this one song that people are really digging. And now maybe I'll go ahead and make the full production of it. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with releasing a couple of songs because you're trying to build a super fan. A super fan. I, look at the Grateful Dead and what they did. They allowed tape recording. Mm -hmm. And did they lose any money off of that? No. Because all these bootleg tapes that are going around and people are coming and doing this, it just built more excitement. It was its own promotional tool. And it built all this this whole Deadheads. Yeah. The original and, and, super fans, and right? And that kind of stemmed, too, from like they, the studio albums, you know, were it's hard to capture the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. in the studio, you know, and so right. they that that was one of those bands. I think back then, you know, you just had to see them live. If you caught them on a good night, mm -hmm. they were they were in fact yeah. one of the world's greatest bands. Sure, you know, it's like that energy gets transferred around to different people, and mm -hmm. those people, you know, initially when the Dead started out, they were kind of a real counterculture thing, mm -hmm. you know, and now it's not quite the same. It's, no, no, you know, it's all about corporation and the man and everything that they didn't stand for at the beginning well that whole time period too it's it's you know the 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 the, the record company is going to follow the money train and the, the counterculture was spending some cash because you know a good chunk of them were were you know affluent teenagers i mean i've met a lot the, of those guys though that man they don't they don't have any studio albums they've got like all these tapes and mm -hmm. cds and downloads from all these shows that they, they don't they don't buy the studio record. Right, right. And, you know, vice versa. There's some people that hate live recordings. Mm -hmm. And I just can never, you never can guess, you know. I think for the true musician or musical aficionado, if if you really like a band, you're really into them, if you are a super fan, you want to hear all that stuff. If you want to hear the live performance, I, I'll do that. I'll dig around, poke around on YouTube, try to find people that have videoed this. So just a just to hear what they sound like live or how they sounded here. And mm -hmm. it's not always perfect. It's sometimes right. not. And you just, you know, even last night at that, at that concert, I heard one of the guys and he had a wrong chord and I kind of 
winched a little bit, but I'm, I'm the minority. Yeah. I'm the guy that, that focuses in on the stuff on the musician. I hear this. Nobody else cared. Yeah. They loved it. Yeah. But still, that, that to me, it makes me feel better every time I hit a bad chord. Then yeah. too. It's like, see, he did it too. Yeah. But, but like to us, it's a knife in the ear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it and, wasn't quite that bad, but it was, yeah. <laughs> and like, I mean, now it's like everybody's got a phone. Everybody's got a video running right, somehow. Right. It's like per, forever. You, you really got to step up your game as true. far as performance and just delivery and stuff like that. Because that is true. You're, you never know when you're going to be on Facebook Live involuntarily. And right. So you right. really got to. But what I was listening to this thing about they were talking about you know auditory issues you know deafness tonight is mm-hmm. everything else well they they brought up this point they said people and when they can see something and hear it at the same time their eyes override their ears you know I I I can believe that because you always hear about the people that do lose one of their senses and how the others step up yeah so I think your brain is just naturally yeah well you. <laughs> As, as sophisticated as the human brain is, there's a lot of limitations to it. It really is. If you study it, it's like, you know, you can only see at 30, uh, what, 27 frames a second. So anything that shoots at 50 frames a second, you're wasting your time. Because mm-hmm. the eye can't see that. It can't process it. That's the whole thing with your, the blur. If you're like this, you see a blur. Yeah. It's because those frames only fire off so many times. Yeah, but I thought so, it was interesting that they said that your eyes override your ears. Is it override or just kind of pick up the slack a little bit? I just yeah. it was like this the relationship between seeing a performance mm-hmm. and just hearing a you know a studio record in a dark room on a two hundred dollar pair of headphones True. is quite a different experience. Yeah. 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 You're really having to listen. You're taking away one of your senses. Mm-hmm. But they said together, your eyes override your ears. Hmm. So you know you can, I can go out there and tell you, hey, listen, I can listen to. I, I try to record every show. Mm-hmm. So I can sit there and listen. I can go, you know, that could have been played better. That, that's nitpicking. That's right. just artistic kind of crap. You know, I don't think your average person really is that good at picking it out. But sometimes, you know, well, they're they're also in the moment. They're yeah. enjoying the moment. They're feeling the the bass hitting their chest. Mm-hmm. It's they're they're enjoying it. They're you know maybe you have a cocktail or two in them, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's about the entire experience. Yeah. So if one part of the experience isn't perfect, and like. <laughs> Our ears are trained to listen for those imperfections. Mm-hmm. Most people are not. And, uh, you know, so it's you know, it's the experience. You know, it's a, as I said, <laughs> uh, I'm talking, I'm working on a, another uh, idea for another podcast. And I kind of came up with this idea of the three G's. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got to play good. You ought to look good. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't sound good, the others don't matter. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's true. And, you know, and that's part of the thing it's like you know kind of let your your sound engineer carry it and i know we kind of diverged a little bit here but um yeah well you know, one thing sorry. i came away with from the conference there was I, I don't know who said this but it really rang a bell and struck me pretty hard it was like people don't necessarily remember what you played mm-hmm. they remember how they felt right played. well that's just it yeah and so you know <laughs> that's powerful man it is it is yeah, so that that just means that like okay you want to try to be the best you can mm-hmm. as far as the changes and the solos and all these mm-hmm. breaks and whatever you're doing but at the same time you got to think about well how can i make these people feel positively about my performance right right positively about my music and positive about me as a person you know hey you know show show a video of you doing something mm-hmm. completely not like music wise right you know talk to the people that so you connect with will them. listen right you know right. it's so cool man every time i do one of those facebook live videos you know you get some letter from somebody you don't even really know and they're mm-hmm. like hey i really agree with you i really understand what you're saying i i really needed that and it just is like mm-hmm. well you know i mean part of it being an artist is people remember how you make them feel mm-hmm. whether it's while you're playing your guitar or whether you're talking about you know Fried chicken. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, like, I mean, it's a different world as far as getting your music out there and getting yourself out there. And mm-hmm. I've had it's taken me a long time to come to terms with being able to do that. And still, it's like it's not that easy, you know. <clears throat> but nothing's easy. No, nothing it's is. Not. It's not. And so, you know, our advice to our friend Bob is to get some tunes out there, mm-hmm. and you know, show tell them about the story, tell them about the backstory. Right, right. Where was this recorded? Uh-huh. Who was in the band? You know, who wrote the song? How did you come up with it? What were you listening to then? What were you wearing then? Do you sure. have any photos of then? 
you have any video of you? You have playing? any of the old demos of when you're recording? Yeah, you know, totally. Pull out those little cassette tapes and tell us, snippets of that. Tell us in depth what right. this was all about and what it means so much to you. Let them into your life. And that's, yeah. you know, exactly. And he's he's in a very fortunate position because he's got this treasure trove of content yeah. that he can just put it out there. So, you know, go ahead and say, hey, here's a full song. album. It was a full album, like 14 songs or something? Uh, I don't know. It's a, I think it's from all of his different projects. Cause he had okay. Laisha, which is a band he played in in, in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he's got a bunch of stuff that he's recorded, things that he had on 4-track that I pulled in of Pro Tools and got to him, and he's he's doing a lot of mixing mastering and that. Amazing. So he's got... I just ima- I just know what I've seen that he has, mm-hmm. and I can only imagine the rest of the stuff. But I'm sure he's got. Well, I do know that he had a bunch of uh, song pictures too that he had put out there. Some uh, songs he's going to try to, you know, get off to the the labels and things like that. So I mean, those demos too. That's all great content. Sure. Build your super fan. Let people into your life. Talk. You know, it's one of the things I'm going to do with the good be alive thing. I keep threatening to do this. Just putting it together. Of, a video of it because especially when I got everybody up at the hotel room to sing the background vocals. Yeah. There's a good story behind it, a story behind yeah. what it's written. And that's, if you're going to be a musician these days, that's what you got to do. Because mm-hmm. we don't have the Team Beat magazines where people are going to pull out the poster and put it on their wall. And let's hope not. Nobody wants me on their wall. But anyway, but, <laughs> but that's really back in the day. That's how you got your information. And then, you know, behind the music, boom, 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 you know, we don't have that. You've got to create that. And that's the stuff that, you know, if you get some people that are interested in you, that's how it's going to keep them interested. You got to mm-hmm. constantly just let out a little bit here and there. So that's what I got out of the deal. Yeah. Well, Bob, let us know how it goes. Exactly. Exactly. I look forward to hearing some of that stuff. So I know you sent me a couple of your demos that uh, you had gotten uh, mastered out. Man, it's sounding good. Keep it going, my brother. All right. So good episode. Awesome. Yep. I think, I think it's time we uh, celebrate. Oh yeah. What do we got? This here is oil fire whiskey. Product of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Nice, All right, nice. Here we go. All right. Well, I got a couple couple shot glasses here. Yeehaw. Oh, fire. Man, I like that label. Yeah, it's really sharp That's packaging. Sharp label. And this is from, from here in Tulsa, huh? Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, we are definitely all about uh, spreading the love to our, our local Tulsa. Tulsa, for you guys that don't know, Oklahoma's had a lot of big changes lately, especially we got a bunch of microbrews, got distilleries and stuff, and it's been a really exciting time. It's so. exploding, man. It is. Amazing. Prost. Oh, Prost. Right. Salud. All right. Thanks, guys. Keep it real. Remember, when it comes to your music, it's not just good advice, it's bad advice. Peace. Rock on. <laughs>